Hello and welcome to Media 7, I'm Russell Brown. The murders of Jeanette and Harvey Crewe in June 1970 set in motion a series of events that caused many New Zealanders, perhaps for the first time, to question the integrity of their own police and judiciary. A decade later, this Royal Commission report saw Arthur Allen Thomas, twice convicted of the murders, pardoned and compensated by the Crown. But it left open the question, who did kill the Crews? It became a war over a mystery, and successive attempts to crack that mystery stacked up on the library shelves. Now, there's a new book with a, a new take. We'll look at that, but first, Jose Barbosa surveys the story. Depending on the circumstances, a single act of murder can resonate deep into the culture. The crew murders are no exception. The case has echoed through the decades. But it started 42 years ago in Pukekawa, 50 kilometres south of Auckland. On the 22nd of June 1970, farmer Len Demler walks into his daughter's house on the farm next door. Jeanette and her husband Harvey Crew are missing. There are bloodstains in the living room. But in another room, he finds his 18-month-old granddaughter Rochelle alive in her cot. A police search eventually pulls both the bodies of the crews from the Waikato River. Led by Detective Inspector Bruce Hutton, the police inquiry establishes the time of the murder as the night of the 17th of June, five days before Demler discovers the bloodstained living room. In the meantime, Demler becomes the prime suspect in the eyes of the police. But for some reason he falls by the wayside, and the police focus on a new suspect local farmer Arthur Allen Thomas. Stub axles matching the axle beam that weighed down Harvey Crew in the river are found in a rubbish tip on Thomas's farm. A cartridge case is found in the Crew's garden. Police claim it comes from a rifle owned by Thomas. He's arrested on the 15th of November and is found guilty of shooting and killing Jeanette and Harvey Crew. Thomas asserts his innocence and he repeatedly appeals his conviction. Meanwhile, public interest in the case grows, aided by concerns about police management of the evidence. Uh, evidence has been selected um, that the police have, while they've had certain evidence, have taken part out which they've used in the court and the other part never really got used at all. I'm more convinced than ever I was that Arthur Thomas is innocent. This man is really innocent. In 1973, the pressure gets a result. Mr McNabb, the Registrar, Court of Appeal Wellington, confirmed that Thomas' uh, conviction had been quashed, a retrial ordered. Uh, I sent for Thomas and naturally he was pretty excited about it. Thomas's freedom is short-lived. He's convicted for a second time and subsequent appeals are declined. Two influential books are published about the murders. Trial by Ambush by journalist Pat Booth and Beyond Reasonable Doubt by British author David Yellop. Both are critical of the case forwarded by the police. Did you murder Harvey and Jeanette Crew? Oh, no, of course I didn't. Yeah, I thought you'd say that. The public campaign intensifies to a point that the government orders a report on the case, all of which leads to an astonishing move. We should recommend to the Governor General that he exercise the prerogative of mercy and pardon Arthur Allen Thomas of the conviction of murdering Harvey and Jeanette Crew. A Royal Commission of Inquiry into Thomas's conviction finds that Bruce Hutton and a colleague planted the cartridge case in the garden and that police deliberately destroyed evidence in a tip in Whitford. Hutton appears on the home show in 1992. He manages to glower his way through the whole interview. I think they might have been a little bit blinded to the instructions from a higher political quarter, that's all I can say. He's saying he didn't plant that at all. It was not planted. It's been 40 years, but we still keep coming back to that farmhouse in Pukekawa with an almost morbid infatuation for details. It remains essentially as it was, right down to the carpet, which includes this insert here, which was put there to replace the patch covered in blood. Tantalising questions remain. Who fed Rochelle in that five days after the murder? The popular view is a woman who was spotted outside the crew house two days after the murder must have fed and changed her. In 2006, Phil Kitchen reckons he's found the woman. But you don't know anything at all about feeding Rochelle? Definitely not. And you, 
you'd be, able, you'd, be, you'd be prepared to stand up in a court and say that. But what people swear on the Bible every day now and they're not telling the truth. And quite justly, Rochelle Crewe herself has questions she'd like answered. I would like to know why the police didn't prosecute Detective Inspector Bruce Hutton and Detective Sergeant Len Johnston on the Commission's findings. I just want to know who killed my mum and dad. The crew murders marked a shift in the way this country regarded its police force. It showed how media and public sentiment could feed off each other, and it gave us a glimpse of how powerful that could be. And of course, it's highly unlikely the truth about who killed the crews will ever be confirmed. They are saying it's still me. They want to admit that they fabricated evidence and, and that the fact that they framed me. The police case becomes stronger and stronger. I'll leave it with the public to judge that. Joe Barbosa there with but a fraction of the mountain of media this case has generated over four decades. I'm joined now by the author of that new book, The Missing Bloodstain, Keith Hunter. Doesn't the lawyer who acted for Arthur Thomas at the remarkable Royal Commission, Peter Williams QC. And a woman whose job it is to unravel such mysteries, forensic scientist Anna Sandiford. Hi. Welcome to you all. Keith, for the years on, why write this book now? Many of the people involved are dead. Why do it? Because New Zealand's changed because of the Thomas case. In the mid-90s, late 90s, I'm not sure when it was, but in the Mark Lundy case, I recall seeing on television a defence lawyer put a question or a, a, a comment to a witness on the stand, a policeman, in the context of a spot of a tiny spot of DNA that had been found on a jersey, which in the, in the end basically convicted Mark Lundy. And he said to this policeman, you planted that spot of stuff, didn't you? Now, before and without the Thomas case, he would never, no lawyer would ever have done that. They might have thought it, they might have even known it from time to time, but they would never have said it. Now, he was allowed to say that, he, and he contemplated saying it, because of the Thomas case. Because the Thomas case showed, New Zealanders at large, that we weren't the innocent little country that we thought we were. We had a, a, a justice system which could be corrupted and could be corrupt. Indeed, the phrase loss of innocence came yeah. to me when I was reading the book. Yes, quite. Is there also a personal motive, though? Is there an implicit challenge for you and all the other authors who've written about this to be the one who finally cracks it? No. No, I'm a journalist. I just do my job, really. Uh, maybe others have that view, but that's not my, not, my, not my territory. You don't see yourself as a crusader? Oh, not at all, no. I'm a journalist. Yeah. People put this, this word crusader to you. I think they put it to you because they're uncomfortable if they can't put you in a little box. Well, my box is journalist in this context. It's not crusader. Um, if it was somebody else, I'd do that story. If it was somebody else, I'd do that story. No, I'm not crusading. I'm just doing my job. Peter Williams, why do you think this case has such legs? I think it's very important, if you are interested in the purity of justice, to remember that nobody is above scrutiny. Uh, not the Chief Justice, uh, not the Head of Police, uh, not the Prosecutor, uh, not Defence Lawyers. Nobody is beyond scrutiny. Uh, and the history of this case shows police corruption at the highest level. It shows judicial bias at its very worst, uh, and it also shows a prosecutorial system which on the evidence relating to this case uh, is uh, corroded. What we're talking about here uh, is a man who served 10 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. The damage to that man is immeasurable. Therefore, it is important to ascertain the fundamentals at least. Why did this gross miscarriage of justice occur? And also, to my mind, to expose the sheer arrogance of those people who were responsible, to take their little smug grins off their faces and expose the lies, the perjury, the framing, the planting, the corruption, the conceit of it all. Uh, to me, that in itself is a justification for, I believe, one of the finest forensic books on trials in this country ever written. And I congratulate this man next to me for Thank producing you. such a great book. And I'm not going to ask you to follow Peter's speech per se. <laughs> I'm feeling a little intimidated. Does this case also have a, a special place in your profession? Is it talked about? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, it's one of the earliest examples of where something can go wrong if we don't do the job right from the word go. So yes, people still talk about it. I certainly use it as part of an example when I uh, do lecturing in forensic science and speak to people on this kind of subject. Because that, that certainly is one of the major things in the Royal Commission's report. The, the, the Crown's scientific witness, uh, Dr Nelson of the DSIR, is absolutely lambasted by Robert Taylor. And, and quite rightly so. Mm. The, the fundamental obligation of such a witness is to tell the whole truth in the interest of justice. This yeah. surely is what you would hope would be the case in every case, but it clearly wasn't this time. Yeah, I mean, the, the number one duty of an expert witness and a forensic scientist is to the court, not the person instructing them. And that is a, is a, a message that I've actually spent the last three years since I've been back in New Zealand trying to reaffirm because there's a certain amount of perception um, in New Zealand that... Um, particularly independent experts like me are hired guns and we're going to say what we're paid to say rather than just review the the information impartially now that goes against all the training I've ever had which is we are independent of anybody's influence and all we do is we look at the information and see where that leads us and anybody who's not doing that quite frankly shouldn't be in the job now Keith the meat of this book uh quite clearly, and it's fascinating, is the proceedings of a decade, the police conferences, the trials, uh, those of the Commission itself. Have they just been sitting around waiting to be interpreted? Yes. Yes, they have. What I've done is review all of the evidence that's available. Now, that doesn't often happen. It doesn't happen in an in a, in a, in a official context unless the government or somebody says, let's have a commission of inquiry. If, without that commission of inquiry, no one does it except the journalist who comes along afterwards and has a look, oh, I think I'll check this out. That doesn't happen, and that's all I've done. I've just done something that no one else has done. Did you talk to the protagonist? Did, did you, for instance, um, talk to um, Hutton, the uh, head of the investigation? Did you talk to the Thomas family? I saw a little point in talking to Hutton. I knew what he would say. What he would, what he would, would, would have told me is in the transcripts. I couldn't imagine anything new that would come from it. As far as Thomas is concerned, yeah, I tried to get hold of Thomas uh, in the last few months, I think four or five times, and I think I once spoke to his wife when he was out of, out of town or away from the farm. And otherwise, I never connected. Uh, he doesn't seem to have an answer phone system. And I rang him like, the last time two or three days ago and still didn't find him. So I'd like to make... Con I could have done it differently. I should have done it differently, but, um, but I didn't get around to it. Peter, um, one of the things that stands out is the transcript from the Royal Commission. And Robert Taylor, who was chairing it, there were some thrilling cross-examinations in there. Did, did, did you expect him to be quite that hard-nosed? No, I didn't. Um, usually, uh, some judges, at any rate, are hard-nosed, but it's usually in favour of the prosecution. Uh, the anomaly of this situation was that he was hard-nosed in favour of the defence, which, of course, pleased me. Uh, I was, of course, acting for Arthur Allen Thomas. Uh, but he was acerbic. He, uh, he didn't spare Hutton. But the, 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 the impoliteness of the police, what the police did, they... The commission room, about as big as this, I suppose, was just jammed with policemen. Uh, and uh, any time he criticised Hutton, they all booed the judge. Now, how's that for ethics? How's that for the standard of our police force? Uh, it was absolutely disgraceful. Have you uh, ever been involved? Have you ever been in a courtroom <laughs> where that's happened, Anna? Uh, not that bad, but I have seen um, surprising behaviour. That it was surprising because I wouldn't expect that kind of. Mm that kind of behaviour. But I've been in court where um, I've seen expert witnesses instructed by the, de by the defence, but acting independently, um, yeah, badly treated by police officers. And it's been a, it's been a hell of a shock, actually. Mm. Were, yes. I, I'd just like to make one point. I think it was uh, you, Peter, might have talked about witnesses telling the whole truth. Yeah. This is one of the faults with our system. Witnesses never tell the whole truth. They, they answer questions that are put to them. They might have a whole heap of truths that never come out because no one asks them to, uh, puts it to them. That happened in the Thomas case time and time and time again. Where witnesses were not asked the right questions because people in this this adversary system we have thought, oh, if I ask that question, he'll say something I don't want to hear, so I won't ask the question. So the, the, the whole truth doesn't come out. It never comes out in a trial. We don't have a system that allows it to come out. Just, just to give an insight into uh, Judge Taylor, at the end of this case, which lasted several weeks, the Commission of Inquiry, I was at my home and a truck pulled up the drive. I went out and I said to the driver, what's this all about? He said, oh, we've got all the exhibits and all the transcripts here uh, from the Royal Commission. I said, well, why are you bringing them to me? 
He said, because just as Taylor said they were to be brought to you, including the exhibits, he doesn't trust anyone else in New Zealand. He didn't trust the prosecution, he didn't trust the police. He entrusted me with those exhibits. And we will have to pause now and return after the break with more on the murder case that just won't go away and the role of the media.